Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm here today with art prof teaching artist, Jordan McCracken Foster. And today we're gonna go way back with Jordan and talk about his artistic development as a child all the way to what he's doing today as an artist. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. Jordan, you started drawing pretty early on, guessing from some of these photos that <laughs> you have some influences. Take a wild guess. One of them was a Disney movie, Hercules. <laughs> so what role did this Hercules movie play in your life early on? Hercules was probably the very first movie that I had memorized. And as a two or three year old, I, I would reenact the entire movie. And I'd watch it over and over, like back to back to back. And just seeing the world that was built, the animation, the colors, the songs, and it was just so much fun for me. And I always really appreciate just that fantasy of wanting to be in a cartoon world, you know? And then was there a moment where you started to show some artistic promise or what happened there? So the story goes from what my mom tells me is that when I was about two years old, I would do little things like this in the air and she couldn't, she couldn't figure it out for a while. And what she realized was that I was trying to draw with my fingers is how she puts it. Obviously, I don't remember any of this. And at some point, I guess she put a crayon or a pen in my hand and gave me something to to write on and I just started drawing and doing my thing. And uh, when she saw that, she just started giving me a bunch of paper, a bunch of crayons. She gave me a, a little table when I was like two or three. And, I, and she said, Jordan, do whatever you want. You can draw on this table, you could put stickers on it, you could paint it, like whatever you want, just go for it, it's all you. And having that sort of creativity opened up to me by my mother especially, I think really started sort of pushed me forward and helped me to really get an early start in my artistic dream. Was your mother an artist? Only when she was pregnant with me, which is so funny. <laughs> um, I, I wish I had the photos. I'm sure she has it in a box somewhere, but uh, the only drawings I've ever seen from my mom is when she was pregnant. And after that, never saw her draw. My dad said that he used to draw when he was a kid um, and people have confirmed this, but I've never seen his drawings. I'm sure they weren't kept at, so, you know, but uh, yeah, so they're, they're not professional artists by any means though. So Jordan, tell us what you are making in this photo. <laughs> so when I was like seven, my mom would uh, buy a bunch of art and craft supplies. She didn't know what kind of artist I would be or what I would do, but she just said, I want to give him as many options as I can on a budget and we'll figure it out. So she gave me like cotton, felt, construction paper, glue, um, googly eyes, anything you could think of, crayons, and just put it all on the table and I would just have those art sessions in. She wouldn't give me any super, well, she would give me some supervision if I had to use a glue gun or if I had to use scissors. Those were only two things really. But other than that, I just went for it and I just made stuff. And so I made some of my favorite cartoon characters at the time because I didn't have action figures of them, but you know, that's the closest I could do. So, so yeah, that was Emperor Cusco. That must have been like 2001, 2002, this photo. And I was little and I just wanted to make Cusco. He was my favorite at the time. So, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And then eventually you met some pretty pivotal people in your life who are parts of your life today. It was Michael J. Buffington, who you met when you were 12. Yeah. So Michael Buffington, he uh, he is, I consider him my art mentor. And I met him when I was 12, very randomly. I was with my godfather one day and we were just hanging out. And I think we went to go see someone house who like was making a video game or something like that and it was such a fun day and i remember going back and michael was just at his porch just completely unannounced completely by surprise and uh he and my godfather he said jordan do you know who this guy is and i was like random dude on your porch i have no clue i'm 12. and he was like this guy is like the best artist ever man you need to look at his work and so we went over to michael's place wherever he was living at the time and he drew one of my characters uh, that was developing and he was a superhero um, 
based on like 1970s. And so he drew that and I was just like, this is so incredible because I had never had, I had never really seen someone at that level draw that quickly and draw my character at the same time. Like it was just amazing. Uh, and so, and I still, you know, keep in touch with him today. We talked earlier today. <laughs> and so it's been a great, you know, 12, 13 years of knowing him. It, it almost seems like fate that you met Michael because I can tell you guys, I never met a true practicing artist until I was really at RISD. And so in my mind, an artist was a dead guy in a textbook. Like I didn't really think about them as real people. So it's cool that you met somebody like that so early. Now, what about high school, Jordan? What was that like for you? Were you the art kid or what was going on there? I, I was the art kid. Um, there is actually, uh, it's in one of the slides somewhere, but I actually received the Fine Arts Achievement Award from my high school by the time I finished. But I was, I knew going in, I was like, I want to draw cartoons like the rest of my life. Like, I don't care about any other career path, really. And even though others were saying, you should have a plan B. I was like, screw plan B. I want to draw. Like, <laughs> and I was so determined. So I was, you know, learning how to, draw some of my favorite characters like Spider-Man and uh, Soul Evans, who we just saw a second ago, Tom and Jerry, Aang from Avatar Last Airbender. And I was just determined, I just wanted to do that. And unfortunately, my school didn't know how to guide me in that, in that way because it was very, you know, it was a lot of painting, a lot of still lives and more traditional studio art type stuff. But I specifically went to do animation. And so there were some times where no one really knew how to guide me. And that's where I did some of that fan art. Com Cuke is saying, it's interesting how even as a child, your interest was in characters. I think it's incredible because a lot of us, as you'll see in these videos, have made a lot of different type of work. I mean, we're seeing characters from you now, Jordan, but you did a lot of other stuff <laughs> along the way. And yet, don't you think it's so amazing that eventually we all circle back? to what we were doing in high school. I, I mean, today, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is still a huge influence on you. Can you talk about the whole Spider-Man influence? Because this is pretty oh, yeah. seismic in your life. Yeah, so the first um, time I ever got introduced to Spider-Man was when Tobey Maguire's movies came out uh, back in 2002. And I think I was six or seven years old at the time. And I just fell in love with it. First off, I was surprised Spider-Man could talk because I, I never saw his mouth with his mask on and I thought he couldn't talk. And I was like, wait, he's actually really funny. Like, I love this. And he's fighting all the bad guys. And, you know, his costume I thought was so cool. I still think it's really cool. And I just fell in love with it. So um, I was a huge fan of the Sam Raimi movies. And then I got the games like Ultimate Spider-Man and read some of the comics that I found at the school library. And you know, I just always loved Spider-Man and especially this one, Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse, it has, it has beat out uh, uh, Prince of Egypt as my favorite movie of all time. So, yeah. And you can see it's had some impact on art prof programming, which is always for us so much fun when we get our staff to talk about what they're truly passionate about because it makes things so much more fun for everybody involved. All right, so let's move ahead and talk about how you transitioned from high school to doing your BFA at RISD. How did you make that decision? Because it sounds like from what you're saying, you didn't really have anybody to tell you what to do. Right. Um, so, I mean, I did have um, Michael, you know, but he has his own life, his own family. So I, you know, I try not to bother him too, too much. But in my inner circle, people like that I could see like virtually every day, I pretty much had no one. And so what ended up happening was I realized at some point, maybe like the 10th grade, I said, you know, I, I think I want to go to art school. And I had never really thought about it. I, I went to a portfolio day. At, um, at Otis College in I think 10th, 11th grade, something like that. And just started seeing what schools were, were offering. Um, and a lot of my teachers were saying, uh, you should look at RISD, you should look at SVA, you should look at SCAD, uh, those types of schools. And so I ended up doing the RISD pre-college program. And uh, after that, I went to RISD and, you know, it, it, and I spent a lot of time 
practicing figure drawing and doing anything realistic that I thought would be something that, um, uh, sorry, my poster just fell. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anything that would, uh, that would, I thought would help me get into these schools. So I spent a lot of time doing that kind of stuff just to get in the school, but not necessarily because I really particularly enjoyed doing it more than, you know, the characters and things like that. And I know a lot of you guys in the Art Prof Discord are working on the 2500 drawing challenge. Well, guess what? Jordan did it when he was, what, 16? <laughs> yeah, I, well, so I was given the challenge by Michael again when I was, uh, I can't even remember the exact age anymore. It could have been 14, 13, and, and I don't remember, but it took me longer than a year to complete it, uh, which I don't remember if that was a particular goal at this point, it probably was, and I just, you know, I was a teenager and I was kind of probably goofing off, but I did do the 2500 challenge back in high school. The drawings you're seeing now are not from my high school days, just like you all know. Uh, they look much more unrefined than they are now. And, uh, but that really helped me. I was actually famous at school in a way for doing that because they thought it was so ridiculous. And I had one teacher write a poem about how I was drawing all these hands. And, and I, I, I wrote it down somewhere in one of my sketchbooks. I don't have it with me, but I just remember it having a huge impact on people and they go like, wow, this kid really just wants to do do that. And what's crazy is I've actually uh, had some of my classmates reach out to me in the last couple of years and they say how much they've respected me, be, or especially now because I wanted this goal since I was a, a little kid and I'm actively pursuing it and nothing, there was no point in my life where I was like, I think I want to do something else. It was just always art. I was the same way. I know a lot of people I've spoken to had those choices to make. Oh, I could do this. I could do that. And I never even thought for a second I would ever do anything else. Like even music, which I was pretty heavily involved with in high school, it was never even something I ever considered. So you and I are sort of similar in that way. Now, what was applying to art school like, the process, putting together a portfolio and making all the pieces? Mm -hmm. um, so I am I, I am a procrastinator by nature. Um, maybe Clara doesn't think so, <laughs> but I, I, like, procrastinated, I procrastinated a lot and my mom had to get on my butt about that several times because uh, you know, I was like, oh, whatever, SAT, studying for SATs, oh, whatever, who cares? And I'm just gonna draw stuff. And uh, I applied to all art schools except for USC. Uh, at USC was a school that my mom always loved and we were in LA. And, uh, you know, I applied there to kind of appease her in a way, but I didn't really wanna go there. And I, other than that, I applied for all art schools and I got in, I think all the ones I applied to, um, I can't remember all. I can't remember all of them, but I had several options, and so it was a pretty easy process for me. And I don't even think I applied early decision. I was just like, uh, whatever, just send the application, and you know, you just figure it out. <laughs> so, and yeah. Jordan, you have to tell the story about the first time that you brought home nude figure drawings to your mother and your aunt. Was it? Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, for my mom she was just like oh okay i um she so i i told her i asked her permission i said hey mom there's figure drawing classes at school and some of my teachers are telling me how important it is as an artist so are you cool with that and i said i would be drawing the nude figure i left that i made sure i told her that because i didn't want to get in trouble later and i don't know what she thought i meant but somehow it didn't register to her that i'll be sitting there drawing naked people and so <laughs> I remember she was like, oh, I, and she was like, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable, you knowing what a woman's body looks like. And I was like, no, I'm like 15. Like, what do you, come on. <laughs> so that was one. And then my aunt, when I brought my sketchbook, sketch pad home, it was like 18 by 24. And I was like, hey, auntie, look what I've been doing all semester. And she was like, oh, they got you drawing titties at your school. <laughs> and I was, I was like, there's so much more to this drawing than that, but, I guess, okay, sure, if you want. <laughs> so there's definitely some shock and awe um, whenever, <laughs> whenever I brought that I up. have to say, when you have parents who are not professional artists, 
you really do have to educate them about this new life that you're taking on for sure. Yeah. They definitely <laughs> made some great laughs later on in life for sure. But at the time I was like, oh my goodness, like, am I going to be able to draw? And you know, I just want to learn how to draw. So that was... <laughs> so then guys, in 2013, guess who showed up in my freshman drawing class fall semester? Yup. Jordan. <laughs> so actually this drawing you guys are looking at now, this is the first drawing that Jordan did in my freshman drawing class at RISD. And the assignment was structure. And I have to tell you, Jordan, I mess with you guys so bad that first week of college because I make you draw with crayon, which you can't erase. And I make you draw a drawing that's three foot by four foot. And everybody's head explodes that first week. What was that like, that first time that you saw me in class and you got the project? You, you know what's funny? So I actually, I don't know if anyone else knows this. I, I know I told you this story, Claire, but the first time I actually saw you or heard of you was not from your class. It was because when I was getting ready to go to RISD, I was so excited and I was looking up anything on YouTube or online that I could find to help prep me for the journey. And I found some of your old blogs. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, she's really intense. Like, I wonder if I'm going to get her. Because, like, like, what are the odds that the one teacher I find is really, I would be the, you know, that would be my teacher. So um, when I got the schedule, I was like, is this the same woman? And you came, I was like, oh, snap, I saw her online. Um, as far as what the work was like and everything, oh, it, was, it killed me. I was so frustrated for a long time because there are certain things I just wasn't getting as as quickly. You know, value was a huge issue for me. Composition was a big issue. Trying to learn how to think outside of the box uh, when all I wanted to do is just draw some characters and just take out a little sketch pad and just do that. It, it, I struggled a lot understanding the value between or the value with you know drawing with this type of uh, this type of size and scale and everything. Thank you so much for the super chat 10,000 crows. We always appreciate any support you guys can give us. Our content is 100% free and accessible to everybody. We rely entirely on your donations. So thank you so much. Well, I'll tell you, Jordan, it's so interesting to me that a lot of students in art school, they place so much importance on the success of the project, okay? And now, I think I can say this in front of you right now, this drawing's not that great. I mean, it's okay, right? It's not embarrassing. I'm gonna but the thing is, I think <laughs> this drawing is when I knew you were gonna be something. Because if you guys go back, okay, this is your first drawing, that's the first week, this is the second week, and then you come in with this. Like, this is so noticeably, such a big increment. And so what I look for, especially freshman year, I'm not looking for the result. I'm looking for how far did you leap from one week to the next? And I think you guys can agree with me. This is a really big improvement from the first week of class. I don't know if you even remember this drawing, Jordan, but I felt that this was such a milestone for you. I remember this drawing vividly because I was so frustrated while doing it. <laughs> Um, I remember I would just listen to like some really angry rap music and I was like, and I was mad because the, the whole value discussion, it was, people were saying your, your values aren't dark enough. And I was like, well, fine. And I start going, Aah! you know, <laughs> with, with the crayon. And um, I remember the, even the background or the, the floor uh, uh, came last minute. And I was like, man, what am I going to place this on? And I had this little, um, what's this thing called? I can't remember now. Um, I think it's a seed pod, a lotus or something. Yeah. It, I, so I had it on my sketchbook and it had a texture on it. And I was like, yeah, let's just take that. We'll just do that. <laughs> and I drew it in. I remember you being super excited about that. I was like, oh, good. Finally. <laughs> I finally impressed it. You know, I, I was, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a tough class for a lot of reasons. But I do think that it helped me a lot. Uh, oh my gosh, I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can tell you guys, I kicked your butt a lot. But you know why? Because I knew you could take it. Mm -hmm. There are some students I back off a little bit because I think as a teacher, you want to make sure you don't lose people 100%. So the question is, how far can you keep pushing them, getting them to get outside of their comfort zone, but not so badly that they leave entirely? Yeah. And I, I remember this final project was so intense. And I still remember this image of the toothbrushes 
on the right hand side. And I just remember you got so deep and personal with these narratives at the end of the semester. And so while you definitely had a ways to go in terms of technique, it's like you had the drive. And it's like, that's the type of thing you don't learn drive. It's like you either have it then or you eventually, I don't know, I guess some people might figure it out, but it's like you had it. Like you were not gonna let that go at any point. Am I right? Yeah, for, for me, it, the, not having a plan B is a was a good and a bad thing for me. It was good because I got to spend all my focus on it, but it was bad in the sense that if I you know messed this up, then I didn't know what else I would do. And so I pretty much forced myself to to continue to have that drive, even if it was something that I didn't like. Um, and I still try and do that today as much as I can. Not perfect, but I, but I try my best. We have a comment from Trent. They are asking, are these scratch board? Uh, so what I did was uh, I took a sheet of acetate and I painted one side ink and then I took like a little um, a little X-Acto blade or something like that and just basically did scraffito and just scraped out all the parts that are currently white <laughs> on, the, on the thing. So. And guys, this is a big drawing, okay? I know it looks small on the slide, but I think it was probably one of those big assignments where the collective acreage was like three foot by four foot. So this is a pretty monumental project. Now, what about the rest of art school? Eventually you ended up majoring in illustration. And what was that like? Illustration was interesting because the, the way they have it at RISD, it's, it's like they have a lot of things put into one major. So people who are interested in animation, games, comics, editorial, um, children's book, they're all kind of uh, in the class together. And I found it challenging because similar to high, my high school experience, I didn't have that focus for a long time. And it wasn't until my, my senior year that I really got to say, you know what, forget this, I'm just doing my, I wanna do what I wanna do. And so some of the, classes uh, that I wanted, I was not able to get into. So I had to learn a lot of this stuff on my own. And even looking at these now, they're not great by any stretch of the imagination, but it was my first step into getting into the career that I'm you know, currently working in today, uh, which is concept art. So um, it, it was tough. And, and it was one of those times where I had to really fight to keep that motivation going because there was a period of time in sophomore, junior year, where I didn't see my skills improving so much. And I really seriously thought about stopping art because I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. That was a really rough patch for me. Yeah, I think especially what's hard about a lot of art schools is I know at RISD in the illustration department, there are huge biases for and against certain areas of illustration. For example, if you wanna do editorial, they, they really sort of put editorial up on a pedestal. Whereas if you wanted to do comics, that was more frowned upon compared to if you wanna do children's books. So it can get very tricky because I think students don't always get the support that they need, even if they're in the department they think they should be in. It's very, very hard to find your place, I suppose. And so what happened after you graduated RISD, Jordan? So I graduated RISD June 3rd, 2017. I'm, for some reason, I'm really good with memorizing dates. I don't know why. But um, about two weeks later, I ended up going to San Francisco and I went to visit Michael. I hadn't seen him since I was like 17. So it's been like five, six years. And I said, hey, man, you know, I'm just going to take a trip out here and get to see how things are. And uh, he'd show me around his job, which is what he, he works at the Academy of Art. And I started seeing all of the, the work there on the walls, and I was so impressed. And um, I also knew internally that my skills weren't where I would have liked for them to be. And he said, you know, um, I could help you, but you live on the other side of the country. I think it'd be a good idea for you to come to grad school here. And um, so after fighting with my mom over that and, you know, trying to figure out how I'm going to move you know, with no money pretty much and you know, across the country. Uh, I ended up going to grad school at the Academy of Art starting in uh, fall 2017. So I literally had three months, like June I graduated and then September I was in school again. Um, and it was, it was bizarre, you know, I never thought I would even go to grad school. And so you know, I had to 
really figure out a lot of stuff, but it was also the first time I really got to really truly be on my own. I wasn't living in the dorms and, you know, my, you know, my parents were even further away than they were when I was an undergrad. And so it was a completely different experience, but I got so much out of it. And I think of you today as a concept artist. Can you define what concept art is? Because I think sometimes it's a little bit confusing exactly where that fits in the industry. Yeah, so concept art is a discipline where, let's say you're working on the next Avengers movie, right? And they say, we need to create this concept of Spider-Man or, or Thor or whatever. And I would be the person who says, okay, we have Chris Hemsworth's head. I need to figure out what his design looks like. So I would paint, you know, or draw his outfit and his turnarounds and different conditions that he might be in. Same thing applies for vehicles, props, and environments where they just need someone to figure out the idea of what it looks like. Uh, it's also very similar to visual development, which is uh, more, that's more of an animation term, but it's basically the same type of job. And so they're primarily used in film, games, and animation. And Jordan, what was that transition into grad school? Were you frustrated in the beginning or were you like, wow, I find my place? What, what was that like, that transition? Uh, it was all of the above because, <laughs> um, you know, first off, I was, I felt embarrassed because there were a lot of students who were, you know, three, four years younger than me and an undergrad who were way better. Um, and here I come out of art school and I'm like, man, I'm struggling. You know, so that it was embarrassing and humbling on that level. Um, but it was also very exciting because I really felt like the the training that I was getting was geared to what I wanted to do. Uh, it was not as broad as the illustration department at RISD was, where you have all these things fitting under that illustration hat. Um, I went to the concept art program and it was just concept art. So we're just going to focus on how to do this, 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 and this. And I didn't have, to, I didn't do any sculpture. I wasn't, mess, I didn't touch charcoal my entire time, which I was so happy about, I'm so happy about that. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, one of the best parts too was everything I needed just fit in my backpack. Yeah, I didn't have to carry a big old sketch pad anymore. It was so nice, <laughs> especially when it rained. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray, for the super chat. We really appreciate your support. Yeah, Jordan, I think that if I stuck you on a desert island with nothing but a bottle of water, some copy paper, and a clipboard and a pencil, you would be fine, right? You could totally stay there the rest of your life. Yeah, I totally could, especially if I found like some food. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I I I think it would work. I, I am addicted to drawing, you know. Um and oh, I forgot to mention this. When I was at in grad school, I was a part of a community called Drawholics Anonymous, and they are the ones who are kickstarted the 2500 challenge, which I've kind of brought over here. And uh, it, it it really helped me to find a family, art, art slash drawing family, who and everyone just wanted to get better. Everyone was giving each other help and critiques, and you know we would draw together in the library. We would go on sketch crawls, walk around the city, and hang out and draw. And it was the perfect thing for me. And I considered them my closest friends when I when I was attending the school. I mean, it seemed to me, because I you actually started working at ArtProf as a teaching artist right when you were gonna move to San Francisco for grad school. And so I really feel like I've been watching your development this whole time throughout grad school. And it's funny because I remember when you did these Black Panther characters and thinking, wow, these look really good. But then it's like watching what you ended up with. It's like, it just got more and more exciting. And so I know from a distance, it really feels like you found your place, you found your people. And RISD was just too broad. Like they didn't give you the hard skills mm -hmm. that you needed because I'm the biggest proponent of experimentation. But at a certain point, you got to use the tools of the industry, right? Yeah, that was the most frustrating part because I understand both sides of it. There are a lot of people who are open to doing a wide variety of things uh, and that's totally okay. But for me, I'm kind of one track minded. And as you guys saw my art from when I was little, it kind of makes sense that I would end up here, you know, in this, in this place with my artwork. And I was like, I just want to do this. I don't really care about, you know, getting into a gallery or doing these wild, you know, wild oil paintings. I just wanted to create some animated characters and, do my thing. And so, yeah, it was, it was huge for me to have that uh, finally after so long. 
And I would also point out that what the journey that you took from being a kid to now, it was not a straight line. I mean, you definitely, I think, as we've talked about, had your ups and downs and the doubting and the questioning. And I remember you told me that at a certain point you weren't gonna do shadow boxers, which was yeah. your thesis project and you were gonna just pitch it, which is insane to me. Yeah, well, it's well, I actually was gonna drop it back in uh, when I was at RISD, midway through RISD, because uh, it felt like because I wasn't getting the the training for the animation industry, I was like, well, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm just not good in it. Maybe it's not a viable prospect. And so I dropped it. And the only reason I picked it back up again was because I needed a thesis project and I had to pitch several ideas. And I put this one in there just kind of to make the number 15. And it was continually the one that people were most excited about. And so that's why I continued building it and use it for my thesis. Well, so that's one of the reasons why in these profile streams of the art prof staff, I think it's important that we're real with you guys, that it's not like you just wake up and boom, there's shadow boxers and oh, no sweat. You know, it's like we all go through this. This is not unique to Jordan or Lauren or Alex or any of us. I just think that on social media, you see a lot of artists, they hide all the blood, sweat and tears. And I think it's a big disservice to younger artists. What do you think, Jordan? Oh yeah, totally. Um, that that's always a struggle because first off, most of the artists I follow are industry professionals, and so their bad days aren't very often. And when they do have bad days, it's still so much better than anything I could produce that it doesn't even matter. Uh, but for you know, for someone who's still trying to you know get his name out there and stuff, it is challenging. It's really really tough. I've had a lot of discouraging moments, and I feel like those moments are what make or break you as an artist. You know, are you gonna let something like this sort of, this doubt or this intimidation from one or two other sources because they don't like your drawing, is that gonna affect your career? And you have to make that decision. We have a comment from Amaris. They are asking, will you be doing more art tutorials, Jordan, on concept art and its process? Jordan. I would love to, I would love to. <laughs> I have no problems doing that. Uh, if there's anything that we can schedule, and we could work out so that I could help you guys, I would definitely do it. You guys have to stay tuned for this because in September, we're gonna do a draw along, except Jordan's gonna be with me and we're both gonna use Procreate. It's stuff that I've never used it before. <laughs> <laughs> and Jordan was like, well, Clara, don't you wanna maybe do a little tutorial before we do that stream? I'm like, no, nope, you're just gonna show me. <laughs> from scratch and we're gonna have such a good time. Well, you'll have a good time. I'm just gonna be squirming. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be so fun. Procreate's very easy to learn. You'll be fine. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so what about some of these influences, Jordan? Because we looked at Phil Barassa mm -hmm. and we have John Lamb and a couple of other people. How have Phil Barassa and John Lamb influenced you as an artist? Yeah, well, so for Phil Barassa specifically, I just love his style of drawing. He has this way of draw, like his whole thing is superheroes. He's the D, he's the art director at DC Animated or Animation. And so when you when I see this style, I'm like, man, they look so strong. They look so unique. There there's complexity, but you know it's, it's simple enough to animate. And there's something about this style that I just love. And you could see a lot of his influence in my Shadow Boxers characters. Um, so I love that. As far as John Lamb, he's really good with poses and making things look dynamic. And, you know, there, there are certain people who are able to do whatever pose comes to their mind and they're able to just make them look so action packed. And that's always a struggle for me is how do I get someone who's moving, but, you know, on a, on a single drawing and make them look dynamic and stiff without doing like something cheese like blurring or whatever. So I just I love his work for that reason. Colin Cuke is asking, do you mostly work digitally now? Uh, yes and no. I always have paper around me. Uh, I have stacks of paper that are literally this big in my- He's drawer. not joking, guys, like at all. <laughs> One of these days, I'm gonna have to just pull it out ahead of time and just show you guys, because it's, it's, it's a lot, it's very heavy. Um, but for some of my more, um, my projects that are a little bit more detailed or something that's for a bigger project, I will primarily work digitally because uh, 
I, I need to be able to have that as a portfolio piece or whatever, but I can do both. John Murph is asking, would you say that concept art has to do more with imagination instead of having references, or do you have references to create that type of art? Every concept artist I know has references. Um, one of the first things I do, actually, if, if I get a prompt to create a character, literally the first thing I do is I scour Pinterest and I take all these images and I put them on a board um, and I say, okay, what can I take from this and this and this? And then I will design. Um, it, to me, it's pointless to try and create something with no reference at all. We literally have an entire world with hundreds of uh, cultures and, you know, different ethnicities and languages and clothing styles and it's just kind of and, and thousands of years of history to take from so it's kind of pointless to just say i have it all in here just it's not necessary and what about nicholas cole he's somebody who you've admired a lot yeah it's funny because i i met nicholas cole by accident um and i had no idea who he was um so i don't know so so i was at church one day back at RISD. And I was, and I don't know if anyone's ever been to the church, they usually do a meet and greet type of thing where they say, hey, say, turn around and say hi to your neighbor. Well, Nick was behind me and I had no idea who he was. He just, and I had a RISD sweatshirt on and he's also a RISD alum. He's like, hey, you go to RISD? I was like, yeah. He's like, what, uh, what major are you in? I said, well, I'm a freshman, but thinking of going to illustration. He's like, oh, I graduated from illustration. And so we just got along that way. And he said, hey, check out my work. And I said, okay. And I looked at it and he wasn't doing Spyro at the time. This is like 2013, but I was floored and we just became, you know, really good friends that way. And I think his work is stellar. And, um, he, you know, I, I try to study the colors and everything. It's, he's fantastic. Emily is asking, once you've created your concept art and you're at the final product, what do you do then? Do you try and develop it further? Uh, it depends, you know, usually concept art is for a bigger project. So let's say when I'm in school, uh, the assignment is given. It's like, okay, create a character, create a prop that does this, 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 and this. And you'll have to create it. If I'm not super excited about it, I'll just leave it. But there are some times where I'm like, this is really cool and I could push this further. And then I will turn it into a more fully realized project where I'll add the environments and the props and the story behind it. And also for anyone who's thinking about doing concept art, story is incredibly important. Um, every decision I make is a story-based reason. So can't just go all out there. You know, if the world, if the earth or the story takes place on earth, you can't suddenly just go like, yeah, well in this world with trees made of bubble gum, you know, you just you know, have a foot in reality, have it fit with the storyline and figure it out from there. And I think it is easy to look at character designs and environment designs and just be wowed by the beauty, the visuals, but you know something, the best character designers and concept artists that I know there are reasons why things look a certain way. It's not, oh, I think this will look cool. It's like there's actually things in the story that maybe dictate, okay, why does this temple glow? Why is it blue? And so it's it's really remarkable, I think, the history that a lot of character designs create for their environments and also for their designs. Neil is asking, would you say the process of coming up with different choices is more important than coming up with one finished work in concept art? Yes, one of the things that got drilled into me was your, your job is to create options. And if I'm working for someone or a you know, company and working under an art director, their job at the top is to make those final decisions. You know, if I go to them with one sketch and say, this is what's supposed to look like, and be like, what you been doing? What have you been doing with all your time? Your job is to, you know, draw like several of these and we will pick from the best and then we'll go with that. So, uh, yeah, definitely want to come up with options out as if you were to even see some of my character sketches uh, a couple slides back, you'll see I sketched several versions of the same character before I got to the final. And I know environment design is an area that you also have interest in. And so now we're looking at Fang Zhu. Mm -hmm. And we also have some slides from Nathan Folks. So why are these two artists helpful to you in your artistic development? Uh, Fang Zhu, he was, he was big for me when I was in high school, especially because he was one of the first guys on YouTube showing the concept art process and made it available for people. Because a lot of this information that I have now uh, wasn't really out there, you know, 
you know, 10 years ago. Uh, it's starting to get more and more popular and people are starting to see the possibilities. But he was one of the first guys that I saw. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. I had no idea you could do this or have this even be a career. Um, Nathan Fouts, I really like his work. He worked as a background painter on some of my favorite films, he Road to El Dorado, Prince of Egypt, uh, you know, DreamWorks guy. And just his sense of color is fantastic. It is, you know, it is some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen. And I really, really enjoy his work. And he's so creative with it. So I just, I can't say enough good things about it. Studio Tenidril is saying, I love the way animators squish a character's face for expressions. Seems like caricature. Is that true? Caricature is something I just can't seem to do. Yeah, so when it comes to caricature, it's you know it's making something a little bit more cartoony. And one of the principles in animation is squash and stretch. That's one of the Disney twelve principles of animation, and that's to help bring things to life a little bit more. You know, exaggerate. And I guess that's the the key. A lot of beginning artists have issues exaggerating. And if, for anyone who's ever been in a figure drawing class, one of the first things they tell you, like literally lesson one hundred and one, when you see a pose push it more, exaggerate more, exaggerate that line of action. Those types of things are key because so many people end up making a stiff drawing or stiff painting because they don't do that. And so that's the value of caricature and pushing those emotions and things like that. I'm quick, sorry, I don't know how to say your name, is asking how do you know when you've really gotten the perfect character, when you've reached the end of the creation process? Um, to be honest, there's probably always some change you can make to a character that you think is already good. Uh, but one, uh, feedback. You know, feedback is always good if you have a mentor or a teacher or even someone who's not maybe artistically minded, but they they can tell when the character looks cool or not. That's always really good. The, the other thing is if you're satisfied with it, if it tells the story, that you're trying to tell, then it works. Like, on, for example, on the screen, we have Avatar Last Airbender and the character designs I think are really solid because if you look at what they're wearing and their environment, it makes sense. You know, they're the Katara and Sokka, they're inspired by uh, people from the Inuit tribes and it's very cold up there. So they're wearing all these thick jackets with fur on it. And then you see Aang and he's supposed to be inspired by this, you know, Tibetan monk you know, culture and he's got a particular garb for that and it fits for his story for who he is and where he comes from and everything so yeah neil is asking i feel bad saying this but at first i thought concept art is just painting weapons and sexualized women it's just that it's present in so many games and shows i saw when i was younger what's your take on that <laughs> <laughs> well it's definitely true um unfortunately there is a popular phrase sex sells uh, and there are some people and higher ups who just, you know, that's what they want to put out there. And I always really like when some of those things can be challenged. Like one of the things when I was designing my characters, I didn't want uh, any of my female characters to be dressed in a provocative, you know, overly sexualized way. I made very certain that I wasn't doing that. One, just because I think it's overdone too, because I'm also drawing teenage characters and I thought that would be way over the line. Uh, so concept art is an industry overall, and there are certain things that, uh, that work better for certain projects. And there are some projects that, you know, those things are a better fit and you just have to find that studio or that company or that project that works for you. Uh, I know some people actually Nicholas Cole, who we just talked about, he told me a story about how he was working on a project and they wanted him to address a female character character in a sexually provocative way and he wasn't down he was like nope i'm gonna make this way more elegant and it ended up getting approved because he stood his ground on that yeah and i i think it's important to have examples of that that just because you see a lot of that it doesn't mean that's what you should do too if anything you should be putting out the ideas that you feel strongly about and don't just follow the crowd because i think that's where really strong work enters the scene and then this happened, I think you guys don't know this, but Jordan started at Artcroft not as a teaching artist a few years ago, as you think, but actually in 2016, Jordan was an intern at Artcroft. 
And whoa, our prof was a mess <laughs> because we were running a Kickstarter campaign that summer to raise funds to actually get the project up and running. And I hired a whole bunch of RISD students to help me and I had no idea what was going on. And I would just be like, guys, could you just try this? What if we do that? It was so all over the place. So Jordan, what's it been like for you being in art prof that early on, going away for a little bit, obviously because you had to finish your degree, and then following the journey for the past few years and watching things change so much. It's like a night and day difference. I remember when we I would get a different assignments to like shoot B-roll footage and you know put this link on the website together. And it was it was a lot to to figure out, a lot to handle. And and it wasn't as organized as it is now. So seeing that shift has been amazing. And especially the shift in viewership, you know, like now it's our prop doesn't just feel like a couple people trying to put this thing together. It's a whole community, you know, all the you guys on the stream who are chatting and discord and all over the world, it's become much bigger than something any of us really could have anticipated. And it's been awesome. Yeah. I mean, when I think about what we were doing in 2016, I'm just like, I was such an idiot back then. And I think to a certain degree though, when you start something from scratch though, everything's an experiment. And so much of the time we were like, let's try this. Okay, that sucked. Let's do something else. Like remember when we were doing Instagram live before we started YouTube and we didn't know what we were doing. And it, it's just, it's fun. I, I enjoy it. I think some people it drives them a little bit crazy to work on a project that is not just clock in, clock out. But I, I don't know, for me, Jordan, you've been such a rock at Art Prof for the past few years. I mean, I was talking to some of the interns the other day, they were like, yeah, Jordan's, he's a fan favorite. And you know, you've got that smile, which none of us can argue with. And so I just am like, okay, I want Shadow Boxers to succeed in theory. I want you to have your show on Netflix, but I want you to be here forever and ever and ever. So <laughs> I feel very lucky that we pulled you back a couple of years ago. And so where do you go from here, Jordan? You finished your MFA and Shadow Boxers is something you're still working on. What What's happening next? Uh, well, I'm looking to, you know, work for some uh, company doing animation, um, work on some shows or films. Uh, I've also been offered a couple of teaching offers uh, in other places, so figuring that out. And right now I'm just kind of taking on all these projects, so I'm constantly very, very busy. I'm helping setting up with something called Afro Comic Con, and um, it's it literally seems like every 15, 20 minutes someone's asking me a question about, hey, we need you to do this, we need to, you know, like I got two offers the other day for album covers for classmates I used to, uh, to uh, have it. So it's been a really interesting run and I'm excited to see what the future holds. But like Claire mentioned, the ultimate goal, I want to have my own animated show one day. That has been my dream since I was 13 or 14 years old. And I'm actively pursuing that to the best of my ability. I love this comment from Lisa H. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. And you guys can see from looking at Jordan's development, like we said before, it's not like you just kept cranking out success after success, but it really was, I think, those lower moments that a lot of us have that it really wakes you up and you start to realize really what matters to you in the end. And it, it does really help when you realize, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I just want to do what I want to do. And too bad for anybody else if they have a problem with that. You know, I, I think that you definitely had that realization multiple times in your career, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's been it's been a long time coming. And there, there's actually a comment here. Let me see if I can pull it up. It says, Jordan, if you weren't an artist, what would you have been from Raw Nuck? And to be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, I, I do not have that answer for you because I- Really? I would have been a chef. Yeah, I, no, I wouldn't have been a chef. <laughs> um, I, I honestly don't know. I just, I love what I do so much. And well, I saw this video uh, from Will Smith a long time ago and he said that there's no reason to have a plan B because it distracts from plan A. 
Now, I'm not saying that all of you out there watching the stream should go and just drop plan B automatically, but what he said really resonated with me because uh, like my dad, for example, he really wanted me to be an athlete because that's what he was. And, you know, there are a lot of memories, like my uncle, he was actually in the NBA back in like the seventies, you know, so that was heavily pushed on me. I was like, I'm not really feeling that. I want to do art. I just want to draw it. Um, in those moments of failure really tested me because I had to determine again, was I really in it for the long haul or was just one of those fleeting things that, you know, pick it up for a couple of months and then drop it. And I didn't want to be one of those people. Uh, not to say there's anything wrong with those people, but that's just not what I wanted to be. See, Jordan, you know, what's very funny is I try not to have ideas about students and how I think they're going to do, but I'm sorry to say when I met, I'm like, he's, he's going to, he's going to do something. I just knew because you had such determination and you don't usually see that when people are 18. I mean, when you're 18, of course you haven't had a lot of experience and you don't have the skill set and everything, but it's like, you, you just had this such persistence. It's like, you didn't care if you weren't the person with the strongest skills, right? It's like, you never let that get behind. And I think a lot of people get very upset and well, not very good at this. And it's like you said in grad school, you weren't the most skilled person. But I think in some ways you use that to your advantage and that it motivates you more. And that's hard to do. I think a lot of people have trouble with that. So I, I admire that very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Art Prof has a podcast. You can listen to us on Spotify. Also on iTunes, we would love it for you guys to leave us a rating and a review. Please join us on the Discord in the post live streams channel in a little bit. Jordan and I will be over there. You guys can talk about how cute baby Jordan is and maybe we'll post some pictures there for you guys to see. The invite link is in the video description below. Please subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible. Thank you to everybody for watching this stream, for your lovely comments. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.